don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, what you do here at Hogwarts? Um, John R. MacArthur, uh, or I go by Rick, and I'm publisher of Harper's Magazine. And uh, what is uh, Harper's Magazine? What is, how would you describe it? Well, it's an independent uh, literary and oh, political. I'm, sorry. The, um, I'm going to be editing out my oh. question. So, uh, oh, Harper's. Not, okay, Harper's Magazine is. Okay. Harper's Magazine is an independent monthly literary magazine that does politics, uh, more politics lately than usual because of the Bush administration. And it's the oldest monthly in America. It's founded in 1850. and is a virtual encyclopedia of American culture if you go back to 1850. And it's thriving under the current administration. Um, can you describe uh, kind of your characterization and evaluation of how the mainstream news media performed in general leading up to the, the war in Iraq? Oh, well, the mainstream media sold out the country. It, uh, it uh, went along for the ride with the Bush propaganda campaign. It's probably the worst uh, collaboration I've seen between the the mainstream media and and political power or the the current regime or the or the incumbent uh, president since um, John F Kennedy uh, and the early stages of Vietnam and even then there was more critical reporting once we were into Vietnam there wasn't much criticism of the premise and certainly no one tried to stop the sending of military advisors. But, but in terms of, uh, of swallowing, regurgitating, amplifying the Bush administration propaganda, the, the big media, the mainstream media, were at their, at their worst in a long time. And specifically, can you talk to um, the role that the New York Times played? In well, the New York Times, New York Times led the charge uh, in, or led the the disinformation campaign in terms of what Saddam Hussein actually possessed in terms of weapons. Uh, people have forgotten already that the, the term weapons of mass destruction, uh, which is a non, it means nothing. It's a phrase, one of those meaningless phrases that turns into media speak, uh, was a deliberate attempt to obscure or conflate, rather, the different kinds of weapons that we were talking about. And the main threat that the Bush administration propagandists were selling to get the Congress to vote for war authorization was an atomic bomb threat, a nuclear weapons threat. And the Times contributed mightily to that, to the belief, the popular belief, that Saddam was on the verge of getting nuclear weapons. Uh, most uh, specific, importantly with their, their stories early on about the aluminum tubes or the attempted purchase of aluminum tubes by the Iraqis. Aluminum tubes were intended for conventional rockets, as it turned out, but the Times made it sound like uh, they were going straight into a sophisticated bomb-making, a bomb-making process, and that, uh, uh, you know, if you, looked, if you waited too long to look for uh, proof or corroboration, uh, the um, smoking gun that you're looking for could turn into a mushroom cloud. And so they went way over the line into promoting the, the scare stories. And they legitimized the scare stories. Uh, the media still follows the New York Times pretty slavishly. Not so much anymore, I hope. Uh, but uh, back in September, October 2002, their contribution to the war fever was immeasurable. And uh, can you talk a little bit about um Judith Miller inserting some commentary into some of her pieces. Exactly. Well, J Judith Miller and Michael Gordon wrote the first big story on September 8th about the aluminum tubes. And uh, they clearly placed the confrontation, the blame for the con confrontation, the coming confrontation between the United States and Iraq on Saddam Hussein. That his, I can't quote it exactly, but in effect, his mad pursuit of atomic weaponry had pushed the confrontation to the point where America was considering invading and disarming him. Uh, actually, Saddam Hussein was pretty much flat on his back uh, in terms of his potential for doing harm to anybody outside of Iraq. He was still able to hurt people inside Iraq, but in terms of 
aggressive, uh, offensive potential, it was nil. Uh, and as it turns out, even the more plausible accusation that he was hiding uh, chemical weapons left over from the Iran-Iraq war turned out to be phony, uh, turned out to be false. And uh, he didn't have anything, and his army had already proven itself to be uh, quite incompetent in the first Gulf War, easily knocked out of Kuwait in a matter of, what, three days? I mean, after bombing for six weeks. Uh, and so where was the threat? Uh, it was in the minds of the reporters, editors of the New York Times, the Washington Post, PBS also, the Frontline Program, uh, did some bad reporting on this, uh, partly informed by Ahmed Chalabi, partly informed by Dick Cheney uh, and um, Paul Wolfowitz and uh, uh, Douglas Fife, uh, who works for Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld. And these stories were inflated into uh, the kind of propaganda that um, propagandists, professional propagandists, can only dream of. It scared the hell out of everybody. and. When Congress voted on October 10th and 11th, uh, I call it 10-11 to distinguish it from 9-11, uh, they were voting on, a fraudulent, on fraudulent information. They were voting for war authorization based on uh, information that had been fraudulently promoted. It just wasn't, there just wasn't any, there just wasn't any basis of, of evidence. We knew that Saddam had the intention of building nuclear weapons at one point. Uh, before the Gulf War. But uh, the UN weapons inspectors also, Scott Ritter, David Albright, the ones who were quoted, and there are others who would have said the same thing, not for attribution, felt that they had eliminated his any atomic bomb making potential when they pulled out in December 98. Uh, but what they said fell on deaf ears. So what, what do you attribute these, these failures or short eliminating these skeptical voices, why, why did that happen? Well, Judith Miller was an, act, an activist journalist in the sense of wanting to overthrow Saddam Hussein. She's had a bee in her bonnet about Saddam for a long time. Uh, she wrote a very, uh, I don't know, a questionable book uh, that made it on the bestseller list uh, around the time of the first Gulf War. and. She was obsessed with Saddam and, and with overthrowing him. The question is, why did the Times uh, institutionally back her? And one theory is that Howell Raines, the then editor, was trying to compensate for what he thought was a, an overly liberal image. He wanted to prove that he could collaborate with, uh, with the Bush administration and that he could play it straight with them, although they went way over the line. And, and promoted the Bush administration line uh, story on Iraq. Um, Maybe that the publisher, because I still believe that, that freedom of the press is guaranteed only, only to those who own one, as A.J. Liebling said. And uh, maybe uh, Pinch Salzberger or Arthur Salzberger was pro war and uh, encouraged it. He knows Judith Miller, he knows her personally. Maybe he was giving her. Uh, backing. Maybe uh, she was uh, getting special favors and dispensations from him. We don't know. But institutionally, the Times got behind the Bush propaganda effort and amplified it. A lot of other people went al along for the ride. But in terms of actively advancing the story, the Times was, uh, was the worst. And I'm, talk I'm talking about, uh, which is not to say that the right-wing press wasn't also trumpeting this, but nobody takes the New York Post seriously. The New York Post did less to drive us into war. Fox News did less to drive us into war than the New York Times. Okay. Um, now, what uh, what type of stories did uh, Harper's Magazine do during this buildup that? were kind of outside of what wasn't being covered in the New York Times. Well, Harper's, Harper's Magazine was doing anti-invasion commentary. We were making the intellectual argument against invading Iraq. Uh, number one, it's bad for the United States uh, constitutionally to invade other countries because uh, we're at least 
by nature uh, uh, constitutionalists, not imperialists. Uh, we know from our history that unscrupulous presidents like Woodrow Wilson uh, have used foreign adventures to, you, to foment repression or to implement repression at home. Uh, the Espionage Act of 1917, the Palmer Raids of 1919 uh, are all um, uh, legitimized or justified by World War I. Uh, and the crackdown on civil liberties here uh, was already underway when Bush started talking about invading uh, uh, Iraq and we were afraid that he was going to use it as a pretext for even greater repression. We also uh, didn't buy the uh, WMD argument because we tended to be more uh, sympathetic to Scott Ritter's uh, point of view, but really the main work that was done on what we what was actually in what was actually what what Saddam actually had what we knew he had what we suspected was administra administration propaganda I did on my own I did in my newspaper column for the Providence Journal uh, on TV on the Phil Donahue show um, uh, and later on on 60 Minutes when 60 Minutes finally caught up with the story they did they did a very good segment with me on in December which was the first time that a serious critic uh, of the of the aluminum tube story came to the to the forefront, David Albright. And um, later on, I wrote more pieces. I was on more TV shows. But the crucial time to be heard was between Labor Day and October 11th, not uh, in November, December, January, February, because once the Congress had voted. Uh, the authorization, you, you couldn't uh, get the horse back in the barn. It was too late. Uh, Bush was going to do what he was going to do, regardless of what the UN said, regardless of what anybody said. Although the Times and other newspapers uh, continued to promote the, the, um, the phony weapons uh, stories. Although they were very clever, they changed once the atomic bomb threat receded and people realized that the aluminum tube story didn't really have as much uh, 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 substance as they previously thought, they started referring to weapons of mass destruction in general, which conflated chemical, biological, and atomic weapons, which is already a distortion of the of the reality. Uh, obviously, an atomic bomb can do a lot more damage than even a massive chemical attack or a biological attack. It depends on which way the wind's blowing. An atomic bomb is almost certain to kill uh, 100,000 people, depending on where you drop it, or tens of thousands. And it has a different, more visceral uh, power to, f to frighten people. So they conflated the whole thing. And, they, and, and people, when they heard weapons of mass destruction, WMD, a lot of them thought that we were still, t the Bush administration was still talking about a nuclear weapons threat. Anyway. I did a lot on my own as a journalist because I've had experience writing about propaganda. And, but most of this I did for the, uh, on TV, on radio, because had, we had to move fast. And Harper's as a monthly couldn't, couldn't keep up with the, uh, the, ch the, the, the breaking news. So you would definitely describe the buildup as uh, a propaganda, public relations campaign by the Bush administration? Yes, the, the whole thing. I mean, the, the Bush and Blair start their propaganda campaign at Camp David officially. They sort of roll it out on uh, September 7th when they come out and say, uh, we have a, there's a new report from the International Atomic Energy Agency that shows that Saddam is six months away from building a nuclear weapon. Uh, Blair says it, then Bush seconds it. Nobody asks him for any more specifics about it, and Bush simply declares, I don't know what more evidence we need. And the vast majority of the American press corps uh, agreed. We didn't need any more evidence. Now, it turned out uh, that there was no new report from the IAEA. All you had to do was call Vienna and ask them, and they would tell you there was no such report. And there had never been any report. They had certainly reported on Saddam's former nuclear weapons program. But there had never been any report from the IAEA uh, stating a, a time frame for developing a nuclear weapon. It just never happened. 
And the irony of, all, of it all is that the only really decent story I found on the non-existence of the IAEA report, which um, should have been front page news all over the country, uh, was in the Washington Times, a pro-war, pro-Bush, right-wing newspaper. They buried their story, but at least it came out before the, co the Congress voted. It, it was on page 17, but it was the best, most thorough story I've seen. And can you kind of describe the, the industry of public relations and the impact that it's had on our discourse and our democracy and government officials? Well, public relations has been around forever. Uh, it just gets more sophisticated all the time. The Spanish-American War, uh, the World War I, are heavily influenced by, by unscrupulous public relations. Uh, the demonization of the enemy is a, is a special part of uh, selling a war. It's the second front that I talk about in my book, the propaganda front. And uh, you, so you can't say it's new, but I guess it's gotten more ingenious and more sophisticated, although the, the methods are still the same. They're crude. They're, they take brazen self-confidence. It takes a lot of brazenness for Bush and Blair to come out publicly and uh, state the existence of a non-existent report because, you know, in the back of their minds, they're thinking, what if somebody calls us on this? But they're betting that nobody will, and they were right. Uh, the, uh, the analog in the uh, first Gulf War is the baby incubator atrocity, w which never happened, where Iraqi troops were accused of pulling babies from incubators in Kuwait City hospitals. They never did it. it never happened. But because Saddam Hussein, propaganda works most effectively when there is a ju there is some truth to the characterization of your enemy. There's no question Saddam Hussein uh, had a lot of people killed, a lot of political opponents, and was a a very, very brutal guy. Uh, but it, it, there's a difference between um, killing off your political appoint, op, uh, opponents with the support and sanction of the United States, which Saddam Hussein had for many years, and Hitler, uh, or biblical images of Romans killing babies, for example. Uh, these are more powerful, visceral images and ideas that hits you harder than, oh, this is our run-of-the-mill dic dictator or American client who, uh, who uh, kills Kurds, gasses Kurds, kills off his opponents, tortures his opponents. I mean, it's going on all over the world every day, uh, and we tolerate it in all sorts of countries, China, uh, Myanmar, um, uh, you, you name it. <laughs> we have friendly relations with almost every country that you can think of that practices torture, Saudi Arabia, you know, they're our good friends. They behead people in Saudi Arabia. They don't just execute them. They cut people's hands off. Uh, I mean, this is something that we don't criticize in the United States, or at least the United States government doesn't criticize. Okay. And uh, can you talk about uh, some of the red flags that, that came up that the, the, the bulk of the mass media just wasn't on the radar screen. Well, the, re the reddest flag was the phony IAEA report, and the second reddest flag was the f aluminum tube story. First of all, why does the attempted purchase of aluminum, where does the attempted purchase of aluminum tubes, even if you assume the worst about the tubes themselves, how does it amount to an, a, an actual on, uh, 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 nuclear weapons building program that's far along? given what we know from the UN weapons inspectors. Why weren't they putting the old UNSCOM inspectors on TV or interviewing them uh, in September and October? Scott Ritter was out there, but he was quickly marginalized as a crank and an anti-war fanatic. Uh, but there were others who would have been happy to talk. These are quiet uh, scientists and scientific types, like David Kelly in, uh, in Great Britain, who killed himself. You have to draw these people out, but that takes work. David Albright, these are people you have to go find. I mean, they're, they're findable, but you, ha you have to do a little work. And, and uh, reporters had no interest in doing it. They were happy to be, and their bosses were happy to uh, follow the party line. Saddam's about to get an A-bomb, and he might throw it at us.
And did you watch much of the uh, network ABC, CBS, or NBC? Yeah. The, and what is your characterization of what you saw? Well, the major networks were just as bad as the Times. The only exception, as I said, was 60 Minutes on CBS. Did a very good story in, uh, in uh, December. French television, which I also work, which I also worked with, did an even better story almost the same day as 60 Minutes, but no one here saw it. Uh, and Phil Donahue had me on on September 12th, and I basically said everything I'm saying now on September 12th, 2002. I said the Bushes are making this up as as they go along. Uh, uh, Americans think that Saddam already think that Saddam has a nuclear weapon. 65 percent of Americans in one poll said they believed Saddam actually had nuclear weapons. And at that point, not even Bush was saying that. Uh, but, you know, Donahue's show was canceled about three months later. Didn't get very good ratings. So, um, and, and I have to say, uh, uh, Frontline on, on, C on PBS was also culpable. They were also advancing the Chalabi line on uh, Saddam's weapons capability. Look, all you have to know is that Chalabi is a is a con man of the first, you know that he's a guy who was in trouble with the law for embezzlement. He's a he's a an emigre telling emigre stories. If you know a little bit of history, you know that emigre groups uh, throughout the throughout history have made have told tall tales to get back into power. They'll say anything to get themselves back in, uh, in, into their country. And uh, for someone like Wolfowitz or, or Fife or, uh, or, or I think Wolfowitz and Fife are the, Fife, Douglas Fife, excuse me, are, are the principal cul culprits, ideologues who are determined to find a justification for what they've already decided they want to do, Chalabi's perfect because he tells them everything they want to hear. Judith Miller wants Chalabi, she wants, she's already decided Saddam should be overthrown. Uh, she's convinced her bosses to some extent at the Times. Uh, she, but she, she, so she's delighted to recycle Chalabi's stories or Cheney's or Wolfowitz's stories uh, because it, it, uh, it justifies uh, her reporting. Okay. Um. An issue of international law, did you uh, follow the debate of whether or not, you know, the United States said we don't need a second resolution and virtually all of our allies and everyone else in the world was saying that we did. And then there was a switch, you know, after June 31st, all of a sudden Bush changed his mind. But from the press standpoint, there's no explanation as to why. You know, were you looking at, you know, the need for the second resolution and, and you know, was, was this war even legal? and and it, it, if both the Democrats and the, and the Republicans don't care about international law, there doesn't seem to be a debate. Well, I think the war was clearly illegal under international law. It also was probably unconstitutional uh, because we didn't have a formal declaration of war, and the war authorization was passed on the assumption that the United States would go to the UN and get formal uh, approval. Now, nobody sued. No congressman has sued the president or challenged this in court, but you could make the argument that the, it was also unconstitutional. It's definitely illegal under in international law because uh, Iraq didn't attack us. There's no self-defense uh, justification for invading Iraq. Uh, and there was a willful misinterpretation of the second resolution issue in the American press. Uh, if you watch Charlie Rose uh, on PBS, uh, he seemed, ap for example, he seemed absolutely incapable of explaining the French position or the German position. Uh, he would put Washington Post and New York Times people on. He'd put on uh, Jim Hoagland from the Washington Post or Patrick Tyler from the New York Times, and they would all sit around expressing incredulity about the French position without ever explaining what it was, saying, can't they understand that Saddam is a, is a threat to... Uh, humanity and to the civilized world? Can't they understand that? And that no one would ever say, uh, well, the French uh, are interested in seeing international law respected or observed, and they say the United States needs a second resolution to justify the invasion. You couldn't, or, or th you know, this is the French position. 
it would put those people on. So. So there's, you know, I've even there was, to, you know, journalism professors at NYU and, and editor and publisher, and it's not even on their radar screen, international law. They say it doesn't matter. Well, Americans, for the most part, don't care about foreign, foreigners, and they certainly don't care much about international law, although when it suits us, we, we pay very close attention to international law when it suits our self-interest. But in this case, international law was the obstacle. The, the, it's been explained to me by uh, a French diplomat that they went through the motions of trying to get UN uh, sanction for the invasion because Tony Blair asked Bush to do it knowing that if they couldn't get it, Bush was going to invade anyway. And that's the most cynical sort of politics you can imagine. Blair, it makes you, uh, in some ways, makes Blair even worse than Bush because he knows it's a, it's a fraud. He knows that the, the whole thing is a, sh it's a charade from the beginning. Uh, the, the whole process of trying to get the UN to go along is a charade because nobody, if we could get it, fine. If we couldn't get it, we were going to do it. Any, we were going to invade anyway. And can you kind of give a summary of why international law matters from the perspective of uh, other countries? Wanting, you know, how does it protect them, and 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 how it affects their view of the United States? Well, for a country like France or Germany, uh, international law and the UN matters because it's the counterweight to American power. They want. There's no more balance of power between the Soviet Union and the United States. The United States is the completely dominant superpower. So for smaller countries that still want to participate in the world debate, uh, international law, they hope, will provide a check on American uh, policies or aggression. Uh, some people, and it's not just about politics, some people think international law should be the future of the of the world and that we should uh, uh, have some kind of world federalism and world I mean, that's the, the the premise of the united nations and the united nations charter is to have universal um, uh, rights uh, for all peoples now we know that there's no such thing that universal rights are simply a uh, at this point still a a nice sounding uh, slogan uh, and the UN Charter is a nice sounding document and that most countries don't respect or many countries don't respect univer the universal rights laid down by the UN. Nevertheless, uh, for those of us who, are, who hope that someday the world will be governed by, by more civilized uh, laws and that humans will be entitled to basic rights, uh, we look to international law to, to promote that. Here in this country, which is the most chauvinistic uh, uh, and nationalistic country in the world, I think, uh, uh, international law is, is for foreigners until it helps us, as in uh, the World Trade Organization. We like the World Trade Organization and international trade law when it favors the United States. Okay. Uh, last question I have here. Um has to do with uh, the sanctions, and I know that Harper's has done some reporting on the sanctions. So talk about, you know, how a lot of people on the right will say, you know, it's Saddam's fault, and then, you know, other people on the left may say, oh, it's all of Americans' fault, right. you know, the sanctions. And what is your sense of, uh, you know, the sanctions policy? Well, Harper's did a very good, we published a very good piece that I'm proud of uh, by an academic in Connecticut about the UN sanctions against uh, Iraq because we were starving that country. We uh, weren't starving the elite. Uh, Saddam was living high on the hog and, and so were all his friends and party apparatchiks. Uh, but we were starving that country of medicine, of food, of clean water through the UN sanctions program and it was cruel. It was really cruel. And, and through this resolution 660 I think it's called, uh, we found pretext for keeping all sorts of essential medical supplies and things from going into, the, into, into Iraq through the UN with the sanction of the UN on the grounds that, these would, that these, if we let these things in the country, it would somehow help rearm Iraq. And this was all preposterous. It was really just a, uh, a cruel, uh, you know, a cruel, it was just, it amounted to really inhumane treatment 
of poor and defenseless Iraqis. It didn't hurt Saddam much because he could get what he wanted on the black market and through his, his uh, secret channels with other uh, cooperative countries. So the sanctions program uh, was in and of itself a, a, a kind of a, a charade. It was, it was initially aimed at starving Saddam into submission or into resignation. It didn't work. And it ended up starving and killing a lot of innocent Iraqis. We don't know how many thousands of people died. I'm convinced, though, that the sanctions also did have an effect on the Iraqi military. You cannot pretend that the Iraqi military or the Iraqi weapons capability was anywhere near what it was when Saddam invaded Kuwait. And even then, as I say, it was exaggerated. It was quite exaggerated. You see that we, we mopped up Saddam's supposedly fearsome army in a matter of two months, uh, and the ground war lasted three days. Uh, so try to imagine Saddam's army after eight years of sanctions with not much food, not much money, not much current, hard currency coming in. It's, it's, it's crazy. The whole thing was crazy. It's a cakewalk, but yet it'll be, he's the biggest threat in the world. Yeah, right. It's a cakewalk, but it's the big, he's the most dangerous man in the world. And still, to this day, they're justifying uh, invading Iraq because we've eliminated the menace of Saddam Hussein. From a purely military point of view, and I guess strategic point of view, I would argue that the Iraqi insurgency is a greater threat to the stability of the Middle East now than Saddam Hussein ever was. Uh, it's out of control now. And there's, uh, it's, I think we've probably already surpassed the number of, of, of corpses uh, in this past year than Saddam uh, caused in, in a good year or in a bad year. Uh, we're, we're catching up with Saddam's record. And it's a lot of people being killed in the crossfire, but it's also a lot of people being killed deliberately to terrorize them. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, well, I think we're out of time. Uh, yeah, let me just sit for like okay. 10 seconds just to okay. get some tone. Okay. I mean, do you understand the UN was being manipulated by the United States in this sanctions program? Are you going to get into that? Uh, do you want the article? Make sure we we'll make sure we give you the article if you want to write it into the script. But well, it, yeah, the United States was was you know the UN. Everyone says the UN stood up to to the United States. The UN didn't stand up to the United States in its application of, of Resolution 660 and the I think it was called that or in its application of the the sanctions on Iraq. Uh, they let the United States uh, manipulate the program to the, to the detriment of ordinary Iraqis. It didn't do much to hurt Saddam. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think that's okay. Okay.